Well, it's so good to be here with you. You know, last week we talked about repent, about getting a change of thinking. And um, it's moving me over into a thought process today uh, that's really important for us because the world needs us to live righteous. <laughs> Amen. We were made to display. I said we were made to display. And so turn over to Matthew chapter 6, 33. As you're turning there, I want to remind you a very familiar verse that I use often here. It's in Matthew 15, 3, where Jesus Christ himself said, why do you forsake the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? And you know, there's a lot of traditions out there that even try to use scripture and it takes things out of context. And you know, I've been around people who honestly just want to do right but they have some of the most frustrated lives because there's nothing more frustrating than trying to do right and still feel like you ain't right. That on the inside, that action did not achieve the goal of personal peace. It hasn't brought you to the place that you're all that you're trying to do to do right couldn't get you there. In fact, Paul himself said this. He said, you know, everything I was trying to do and not do, I found myself doing what I wasn't wanting to do. No matter how much I tried. He said, the things I didn't want to do, I found myself actually doing them. And then he just acknowledged, man, I'm, I'm just in sin. I can't get out. He said, who's going to help me? He said, thanks be to God. He said, thanks be to God that he causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen? So, again, you know, obviously as a church, we have people that come in to, from other churches, from other backgrounds, all kinds of things, and that's why we say, you know, there may be a tradition that you've heard, and when we go through Scripture, you may have to abandon that tradition so that you can follow the plan of God. Number two, we also say this. You don't need to believe anything I'm saying just because I'm saying it. But if you'll search the scripture for yourself, then you know the Holy Ghost is going to teach you and guide you in the right direction. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Amen. I think to myself, especially when we do our confession over our offering, I'm thinking, you know, first time guests could think, wow, these people are just like, you know, reciting things. Well, you know, when I go to a game, there's cheers that take place. And everybody's reciting something together. Now, we all, nobody even talks about that, right? But that don't bring any change. I would love to believe that the cheerleaders actually change the game. That's why when they lose, I always blame the cheerleader. I'm going to say, it's your fault. Because, I mean, your cheering is supposed to inspire the team. Now, I do believe that there is a place where the emotions and the energy that is in the stadium will affect the players. I do believe that. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, they win because they actually achieve the plan. So their focus may get a little more focused because they realize this win would mean a lot more to win just for me, but everybody in the stands. And at the end of the day, you still have to be focused to carry out the game plan. Are you hearing me? You know, we were made to display some things because God wants us to carry out a plan. Yes. Are you hearing me? And in Matthew 6, he's very clear. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So it's not just his kingdom because here's the thing. You can't seek his kingdom and get separated from his righteousness. That's right. That's good. Come on. Because the kingdom is going to let us know what's the right way of doing it the king's way. Yes. Who is by all right life and love? He is the author of creation. This is why we've said often, you know, when it all comes down to it, it comes down to who are you going to let define the words you're thinking? Who are you going to let give you the definition of that? If we're going to actually take the time of why we are doing what we do based upon what we've heard, well, then let's go back to the author of words. For the scripture says, in the beginning, 
I said in the beginning, before there was a heaven and earth, in the beginning, God. In the beginning was God. And the word was with God and the word was God. So God is the author of words. So he has the right to define them. Amen. And anyone else defining God's words is going to fail. And even when you try to define it to be right, it will be wrong. Now, what do I mean by that? The Bible says this, there's a way that seems right to a man. But what happens? In the end is death. Now, death is not ceasing to exist. Death just means to be separated. To be separated. And you understand, there's a way that you can try to do things and still be separated from God. And that is a very frustrating existence. Because in all rights, based upon all that you're trying to do, you really just don't want to be at odds with the creator. Correct? I mean, we don't want to be at odds. In fact, the whole humanity, I mean, there are very few people that literally want to be against God. But at the end of the day, they're still worshiping something. Right? You know, if you get into satanic worship, you know, which is against God, well, he's a God anyway to you. And for whatever reason, you think he'll win, but he's already been defeated, and that's unfortunate. All right? For the ones that say, I don't even believe in a God, that's not true. Because the reality is, there's something you're always believing in. And anything you put in front of God becomes a God. So no one can say, I don't believe in God, because then anything you pursue is your God. Period. In fact, Jesus himself did not acknowledge the gods of the world that man has made, but he did acknowledge one, not because it's an actual God, but it functions like God is, was to function in your life, and that was mammon. Because here in Matthew 6, he says, you can't serve both God and mammon or wealth. Now, he didn't say you can't have wealth. He just said you can't serve both. Because you'll love one and hate the other. In essence, he says, money has a way to get inside you and, and govern how you live. Many people have said, well, I can't afford. Well, who said you can't afford? Your wallet or God? Because there's many things I've done without it being in my wallet. But before I got to the place that it was necessary to have some kind of finance, God was able to get it to me. Either get it to me directly or get it through someone to me. Or God just let someone say, don't worry about paying. (laughs) At the end of the day, I did what I was to do because God said do it, not because my wallet did. Hallelujah. So my car doesn't define me. Are you hearing me? So whether I'm driving something that people would not consider luxurious or whether I am. Because the car itself doesn't, my house does not define me. Notice how we put definitions. I'm a millionaire. Well, no, you're not. You're a child of God that happens to have a million dollars. And that's a different perspective. So what we identify ourselves with actually becomes our God. And anyone who is doing this is still trying to live a right life. I get it. I get it. But in order for us to actually live a right life, we have to actually seek his righteousness. It says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, if you'll just do those two things, what will occur? All the things, all these things will be added to you. Now, if you want to know what these things are, you have to actually go back up a few verses. And he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. In essence, he said, don't worry about the necessity of life. Don't worry about what's going to come to you in things in life because I can get that to you no problem. And man, I can be a living testimony of God getting it to me no problem. No problem, because if I just do the first two, I'm guaranteed the rest. And what happens is I actually get what everybody else is worrying to get. What everybody's in uh, anxious to have. What everybody's in turmoil to possess. God just hand it to us. Because we seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness is not a religious word, and neither is kingdom. Because kingdom is a government. 
And God came to reestablish a government on the earth. So this may be a little shocking to any guest here because you're like, oh, I thought this was separation of church and state. Well, you understand that's something in the United States, but God never expected the state to be separated from the church as far as he's concerned because we are his government in the earth. We are in his kingdom. We reign with him. And that government is tangible, but it's not limited to natural territory. The United States has a, you know, um, a boundary that has been described uh, through some process that says this line of dirt is legally the U.S., not Mexico, or it's legally the U.S. and not Canada. I mean, you could just literally do this. I've been up there to New York when we went over to Niagara Falls, and I literally, if this is Speakers Canada and this is the United States, stood like this. One foot is legally in the US. The other foot is legally in Canada. Well, how do I know this? Cause a word's telling me. Okay. A word is telling me this. Well, you understand God's not limited in territory with his kingdom, he owns the planet. So his kingdom can function everywhere and does function everywhere if we are functioning in it according to his righteousness. Because righteousness is not a religious word. It means right standing with the governing authority. It's in essence, Lord, what do you say? And when you do that, then you're righteous. Now, how's this effect in the natural? Well, we see this in multiple stages. We see this concerning driving. Can you be a righteous driver? Can you be an unrighteous driver? <laughs> Yes, yes you can. <laughs> you can run a red light and that makes you unrighteous. You can go 20 miles over the speed suggestion. I mean, we all interpret it that way, you know you do. Uh, 55 is a speed suggestion. But when the police officer pulls you over doing 85 in a 55, well, it seems to be the problem, officer. <laughs> um, and I love what, did you know? <laughs> did you know you were speeding, right? Did you know? Really? I didn't know. <laughs> and then some would try to cry to get out of it. And what are you doing? You're trying to find mercy. Because again, is it not true that the majority of everybody, even in this room right now, when you're driving down the road and you see a police officer, you put, take your foot off the gas? Why do we have this habit? Inevitably, we're like, we must be unrighteous. <laughs> we'll pull it off and start to break. Amen. That is... The easiest way for me to describe righteousness and unrighteousness. Yeah. So when we're talking about righteousness with God, it's the same thing because God has ways that his kingdom functions. Yeah. And when we are violating that, there's a sense of guilt that can show up, right? Now, that doesn't mean God's not merciful and give you a warning. Many of you have sped. You know that you deserve the ticket. You should have to pay the fine. You should have to go through the class. But that officer was merciful. Gave you a warning. And a warning gets typed into their computer. So that if you get picked up 100 miles later, they'd be like, didn't we just warn you 100 miles ago? <laughs> Apparently, we're going to have to go ahead and let you feel the brunt of your choice. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> All right. So righteousness is right standing with the governing authority, and God wants us to seek his righteousness. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says this, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now, I like this because, again, it really just equates what sin is. So if righteousness is doing it God's way, unrighteousness would not be doing it God's way, then righteousness is according to God's, in one sense we could say law, 
And when I say that, I'm not trying to say anything that, you know, gets people into legalism. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying he's king. He speaks. And that's. And there is a law in the new covenant. It's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I am under that law. Thank God. Because the minute I got under that law, I got freed from another law. And that's the law of sin and death. And that law legally bound me to the devil and to a, a, a way of living that was contrary to God. But Jesus redeemed me. I said he redeemed me. He paid the price. Now, I had to pay the debt, but I couldn't pay it. But he could pay it. And he paid it. So then sin is lawlessness, or sin, simply put, is not doing it God's way. So he goes on and said, everyone who practices, say practice. practice. Say practice. practice. Now, practice is someone who just does it. This is what they do. So anyone who's not in Christ, this is what they do. And the church has really done a terrible job. The religious church has done a terrible job of trying to make lost people right without the way they should be right. I can't believe you're doing that. How can you not believe they're doing that? They are separated. They can't help but sin. What we should be is like, so how's this life treating you? Would you like a better life? Oh, you're going to tell me it's, I'm, I can't do it. You're going to do it. And I am, I'm not going to tell you you can't, because you are. You're going to do it. And no matter how much you try to stop, you're just going to substitute it somewhere else. Right. I'm just asking, do you want something different? Right. Because that's going to be different. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, you know, we don't be surprised when things are happening. People are so surprised what's going on in our own nation. Why are you surprised? The Bible tells us it's going to happen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So he goes on and says, for you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him abides, abides, say abide, abides in him sins, and no one who sinned has seen him or knows him. So the minute you abide in him, then sin is not your problem. All right. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness, say practice, is righteous. Just as he is righteous, the one who practices sin, say practice, is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, what? To destroy the works of the devil. No one who was born of God practices sin, say practice. Because his seed abides in him. And he cannot, say cannot. So you cannot, if you're a child of God, say, I'm just a sorry sinner saved by grace. You can say, I was a sinner. That's just what I did. I was separated from God. I wasn't doing it his way. I was trying to do a way. I was trying to do things right. But it always felt empty, no matter what. There was these high moments and low moments. High moments and low moments. I'm like, woo! But then all of a sudden, I'm still confronted with myself, and I'm deficient. And life's frustrating, and I just want to be set free from that. And Jesus comes along, yeah. and the message of Jesus, and the price he paid of Jesus comes along, and we believe in that. We receive it by faith, uh, through grace, or by grace, through faith. Then we become born again. We'll see about it here in a minute. And now we become believers. And believers cannot, in their spirit, sin. It's not their nature anymore. I said it's not their nature anymore. Are you hearing me? So we need to identify with our new nature because we were made to display. We were made to display. Now, I know what the problem is, and it's found in 1 John, I mean, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. He says now that our spirit, soul, and body is to remain blameless. The problem is the majority of churches are teaching one-dimensional man, and man is not one-dimensional. Man is spirit, soul, and body. Now, here's the thing. Man, before Christ, his spirit is dead. Yeah. 
So in essence, man only operates through two dimensions. His soul, his emotions, his mind, his thinking. Uh, it's where he, he connects his will of choice of what he wants to do. And he's always siding with how he feels. Yes, that's right. And what's happened to him and what took place. Because the things that he sees pushes his narrative. And then by how he feels. Yeah. How he feels. And so he goes, if it makes me feel good, I do it. Even though after you do it, you find out that you don't feel so great. Yeah. And there's this vicious cycle of feeling great in your body and then feeling horrible inside. But God. I said, but God. But God. Then when he, he makes our spirit alive. And he does something to that spirit that changes everything. But now that spirit in us has to get our soul together now and tell our body, you ain't telling me what to do no more. And it get, puts in you such a strong spirit that it, there's no excuse for it not to affect the other two parts of your life. Are you hearing me? So he goes on and says this, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of devil of the devil are what? What are they? Come on, what are they? It's obvious. So when you look out on humanity, you cannot look out on humanity by um, how they look, how tall they are, how short they are, how much weight they have, how little weight they have what gender they are, what gender they are, are not. You can't look at the color of their skin because there's only two types of people. Those in the family of God and those in the family of the devil. Only two. And the devil has in his family every tongue, tribe, and nation. Every gender. He has every economic status. He has every uh, color of skin. He has it all. But guess what? In the kingdom, so does the Lord. So does the Lord. Hallelujah. And those are the only types of people on planet Earth today. It's the only ones. And he says that these two are obvious. Which tells us, then, if I, uh, because of the finished work of Jesus, am made righteous, then I was made to display it should be obvious. That the devil is not my daddy. It should be obvious. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, why is this even in play? Why does Jesus even have to come to destroy the works of the devil? Well, Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we know that the Bible tells us, in verse 26, God said, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule or have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, over all the cattle, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, over all the earth. And so man was to have dominion, both male and female. They were to have dominion. They were created in the image of God. In essence, that word means they were a car carbon copy. They are not God them themselves, but they are in the image of God. They have the DNA of the creator. And he is life. He is love. He is righteousness. He is light. And in him is no darkness. So there's no sin associated with him. He is perfection. And so he creates both male and female, and he breathes into them, breathes into this one skin suit, the breath of life. He becomes a man. We know him as Adam. Out of Adam from his rib side, he creates woman. Her name is Eve. And they both together, co-labor together to dominate the earth like God. In essence, they've been made righteous. There's no sin. None. Yet God needs to see their righteousness on display. Needs to see it. How is he going to see his, their, their righteousness? I mean, they're made righteous. They're right. God comes down in the cool of the day. 
I mean, he talks with them, fellowships with them. There's no issue. They run to him. I said they run to him. Now, you know somebody's got challenges with God if they can't run to church. Because Jesus is the head of the church. We're the body of Christ. Now, you may have problems going to some because they're not, it's not the church Jesus is building. I get it. But the church Jesus is building is in the planet. I can tell you there's one right here in St. Augustine. And you can run to it and be safe. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they would run to him. They would hear him. They would talk with him. I mean, when the Lord came and said, Adam, why don't you name the animals? You know what? He did not find Adam behind a tree hiding. Okay, I'm going to say that again. When he came and said, Adam, listen, um, this is how I want you to take care of the garden. You're going to tend here. You're going to multiply here. You're going to do this. He's giving him instruction, right? Is Adam like scared? Is he afraid? Because he's righteous. He has no problem talking with the Lord. The Lord said, name these things. Name these animals. And he keeps bringing them by one by one. No problem. But then in Genesis chapter 3, Verse 7, after they eat the fruit, for the Lord says, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day you eat, you will surely, you'll die. And we've said before, if Adam had never eaten the fruit, where would he be today? So he wasn't looking to go to heaven because heaven came here. Are you hearing me? So he's righteous, yet God says, display it. How do you display it? Through obeying. Yes, and he's perfect. I mean, he, it's not like he's got to take a class. He's not having to renew his mind. His mind's wide open, more wide open than our minds even. I mean, he knows all. In the context that his mind is not impeded with sin at all. Wow. And God says, display your righteousness. Show me you love me. Keep my word. Now, this is important because there's a false statement about God that runs in the planet today, and that is God is in control. Well, let me tell you, if God was in control, Adam never would have ate that fruit. Because don't you think God couldn't come down and snatch that apple out of his hand? Don't you think God could have, when he went to reach for it, put a force field around it? Had an angel appear. Yeah. What are you doing, bro? Yeah. Didn't dad say don't touch the stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Go on. Now, the reason why this is such a damaging statement is because when we give God control of everything, then the devil makes God look bad. Well, if there's a God in the world, why is there war in Israel right now? Well, because somebody else is in the world. Because somebody else came to the garden. I said somebody else came to the garden. Because what God told Adam was, keep my word. You keep my word, you maintain righteousness. He says, son, keep the garden. So he's in heaven and there's an anointed chair by the name of Lucifer who tries to rebel against God's kingdom realm. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. God expelled him, kicked him out. His rebellion against the kingdom forced him out. And everyone who sided with his party, he, he kicked out of the heaven's realm and put him down in the earth. So now a serpent shows up, which is the Satan of old, the deceiver. God didn't have to come down and say, son, because he's already given his son all authority. We are not forced to be with God. So this is what I like to say. God will let you do whatever you want to do. He does not control your life. But he will hold you accountable with whatever you do. Because ultimately, the day will come that everything is according to the standard of life. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the choices I make when I follow God is because of life. Yes. Yes. It doesn't stop me. It's life. 
How many of you ever touched a hot oven when you were a child? Yep, she listened to your parents. Because you know they told you, right? Did they want to control your life? No. They didn't want you to get hurt. I mean, what parent is going to let a child go across US-1 at three, three years old and just say, well, it's your choice. I don't want to control your life. They'll figure it out. And if the Lord wants them alive, they'll stay alive. Who does that? No one does that. In the right mind, right? I mean, nobody does that unless they're demon possessed, honestly. Because a demon possessed person is of the operation of the devil, which is to kill, steal, and destroy. They, they would do that. So when you say, no, don't go across the road, you're not controlling them. That's right. You're offering them life. That's right. Amen. And that's what God's righteousness is for us. It's offering life, not controlling me. Right. He's offering me life. Yes. He's saying, I just want to give you life. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to choose. Yeah. I can choose and say, I ain't going to do what you say. And then I get the opposite of life. And opposite of life is death. That means separation from something. Separation. God's not stopping me from having sex. He ain't stopping me. I can sleep with anybody I want to. But I'll have what's associated with that kind of lifestyle because God says. Now, if you want life and sex, then you got to do it in marriage according to my design. And it'd be awesome. Be fruitful. But if you do it a different way, it brings death. Again, I can lie anytime I want to. But what does it bring? The results of death. It separates things. My wife doesn't control me. I don't control my wife. I choose to be with her every day. And she's better in silver and gold. My, my, my. It's awesome. Because her righteous life and my righteous life makes our marriage a righteous. You better watch out now. I don't want to... I had, to, I had to say, let's, let's pray now. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm telling you if, you, if you are a believer, you better have sex way more than the world. I'm just being honest. I wouldn't let some person out in the world telling me about all the, all the times they're having, I'd be like, bro, you ain't got jack on me and my wife. <laughs> Nothing. All right. God gave that for us. The devil's killing people. And then they wake up with stuff on their bodies. And then they got stuff in their wombs. And there's all kind of stuff that takes place. And God's like, I never designed that. Like that. Y'all doing all right? Okay. Everybody wants you to be real till you start preaching real. Just be real, pastor. Just be real. Okay. <laughs> I'm being real. Right? I mean, you, there should not be more dancing on Saturday night in the club than there is in the church. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be more shouting in the stadium than in the church. Right? I mean, come on, what are we doing here? I don't know about you, but he saved me. He filled me. He delivered me. He gave me life, man, and life more abundantly. And I'll honor him and worship him because he has set me free. My God, he has set me free. Woo! Oh my gosh, man. You know, I, I look at some people's lives and I'm like, praise God, I have been redeemed. <laughs> and that's not because I have pity for them, not because I'm looking down. I'm just like, there's a better life. You don't even know where you're at now. You've been puking your guts out because you are partying. Really? No, I get drunk in the spirit right here and get stronger by it and get revelation by it and get what wisdom by it and have wealth by it. Oh, praise the Lord. So the devil deceives Eve. She eats the fruit, gives it to her husband. He eats and it says both of their eyes, Genesis 3, 7 were open and they knew they were naked. They sewed some fig leaves together, and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the, the sound of the Lord, 
God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Never done that before. Because when you're righteous, you don't hide. Never done that before. I said they've never done that before. Because when you're righteous, you don't hide. Amen. A lot of good excuses by believers. Well, pastor, you know, I was working. No, you hiding. Because if you're letting your work dominate you so much that you can't be in fellowship with the Lord, we got to miss priority. It's called seek, not your job. You need to get control of your life. Say, Lord, help me get control of my life that my job doesn't keep me out. Hallelujah. So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord called man and said, where are you? He's still asking that question today. Because it's not because he stinks at hide and go seek. It means what position are you in now? And this is why we want to be right. It's because we really want our position back. We want dominion. And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? I told you, don't eat it. You'll die. I'm not controlling you. I just want you to live. And you chose death. You know, that same thing is here. Joshua said it so clearly. I set before you life and death. But then he actually has to give you the answer to the test. Question. Choose life. And you know what? They did not. Still didn't do it. What does this mean? It means being born righteous and living righteous are two separate things. Because Adam was made righteous, but he had to now live it. I said he had to live it. And a lot of people in the church today get born again so that they can be made right. But then they don't, they don't live it. And it's unacceptable for God's kids to not live it. Now, I'll give you, I, I, I grant it. Some of them are a lot of big disadvantage because they've been sold something that's just not entirely truth. Now, when I say that, I mean there's a layer of truth to it, but it's not how we were supposed to live. And that is, ask Jesus into your heart and save you so when you die, you go to heaven. We are not accepting Jesus for death, like after we leave, so we can be in heaven. Yes, if you die, you'll be present with the Lord if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. But it's not about where you're going, it's about him coming. Yes. I said it's about him coming. Yes. Because when you get born again, that means you become a new creature in Christ. Then the Holy Spirit himself comes and lives on the inside of you. That means God comes and makes his abode with you. Yes. God's not waiting for you to get to heaven to be with you. He wants to be with you now. Yes. And he wants to change you now. And he wants to give you dominion now. And he wants to change everything about the circumstance in your life now. Because he wants to deliver you now. He wants to save you now. He wants to heal you now. He wants to prosper you now. He don't want to wait till you get up there. He wants to you to display all that he put in you. So once he does in the spirit what you could never do, now it's your responsibility to do in the soul and in the body what you can do because he's put the greater one on the inside of you. So if you're not seeing all the benefits of the righteous coming out, it's not because you haven't been made righteous, it's because you're not practicing your righteousness. And you are made to display. And there's a lot of people that are out in the world that honestly, justifiably so, because even the Bible says that the world slanders God because of his own kids. It's because they're going to run and go to the club, talk like them, act like them, have relationships like them, pursuits like them, and they're going to tell them, yeah, but I asked Jesus in my heart and he saved me and I'm going to go to heaven, but you're not. And they're like, okay. I mean, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good here. And you're going to tell me you're, 
you're in a better place with God and you act just like me? Just because you believed in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave? That's just very difficult to believe. And if that is true, then I'll wait. So then we scare them. But you don't know when you're going to die. <laughs> what if you died today when we were drinking <laughs> together? <laughs> At least we can go to heaven together as drunks. Right. Hallelujah. No? But when you start living, some people are like, how do you do that? I mean, you are peculiar people. Yes. You should stand out. Yes. And that doesn't mean you won't be persecuted. But let me tell you, Jesus is righteous. Yes. But he also had to choose to live righteous. Yes. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 22. It says, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin. That's a pretty powerful statement. Jesus left you an example to follow his, st his steps, who committed no sin. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He's like, that's an example for us. Now you can say, well, I could never do that on not Jesus. Well, are you in Christ? If you know who you are, then you'll know sin doesn't own you anymore. You've been redeemed from the law of sin. And sin, don't, sin can't tell you what to do anymore. You got a new daddy. Your old daddy can't come up and talk to you anymore and tell you you no good, you sorry, you ain't never going to mount to nothing. You never mounted nothing. He's hollering at you over a great abyss. You're like, shut up. You're not my dad no more. I got a new name. <laughs> I got a new name written in glory. <laughs> Yeah, it's been written. I, my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I got a whole new life now. I'm beyond a witness protection program. I mean, I'm a totally different person. I don't even know who you're talking about because that person's dead. So he goes on and says, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to God who judges righteously. And he himself, who bore our sins, come on, look at this, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to, we might what? Die to sin, live to righteousness. I'm not a sorry sinner saved by grace. I'm not stuck having to sin. I don't have to sin anymore. I've been redeemed from that. I've been changed. I've been made brand new. I get to live to righteousness. I get to live to actually do what God says, and I want to do it, and I can do it, and I've been empowered to do it, and I do it by faith, and I'll have life in everything I touch. For we were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardians of your soul. He's renewing my mind. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Say new. This is not a remodel. Your spirit's not getting a remodel. Your mind's getting a remodel, but your spirit's not. Your spirit's not. I mean, most of you are running with a four-cylinder that was running on one. <laughs> I had a um, minister come who bought a Tesla this weekend, and he's not happy. He's like, they said I could go 300 miles. And I traveled up here, and it took us a lot longer. I could not. I was stopping all the time to have to charge the car. So he called. He said, man, you sold me this vehicle under false pretenses. You told me I'd get 300 miles. He says, no, you can get 300 miles. But you cannot go over 70 miles an hour, nor turn on the air condition. <laughs> So if you don't go over 70, you don't run the AC, you'll be able to do 300. Now, see, that's in the fine print, people. So you're watching the commercial. We're saving the planet. 
and you're going to get all these miles, but don't turn that AC on. This is why I struggle with Priuses. Because all you little Prius drivers, except my daughter, you got the little green gauge in there telling you you're maximizing your battery life. <clears throat> and you're on A1A. And the speed limit is 55, and you go on 35 to maximize your battery. Well, you need to get... <clears throat> You need to get one of those electric bikes and get on the sidewalk <laughs> so that us that like to do the speed limit <laughs> and determine whether or not it's suggestions or not <laughs> can keep going. You know, I hate having to go 85 to get around you. hate having to get there at 35 and it take, I had to get up to 85 to pass that whole string of electric cars. <laughs> By the time I get home, I've averaged 55 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's like taking your four-cylinder that's on one, pulling it out, and they put a jet engine in there. I mean, it's whole new power. Because really, honestly, you just got to understand this. You didn't even get a four-cylinder on one cylinder. You had an engine that was locked up. You were going, in essence, you were flintstoning it. You had an engine that was locked, and you were having to push your car everywhere because your engine's not even running. It's dead. But God snatches that thing out, puts you in a jet engine. You got more power. You don't even know how to handle all the power, although he'll train you how to handle the power. And we're pushing our jet engine cars. Because we're not displaying our righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. He goes on to say, he's a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Now all things, these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Ladies, listen. Y'all's games go a little bit longer than an hour, so I'm conditioning them to be able to handle your game. You know, those things get a little long, right? And then people can't be like, I got to go. This is more than an hour. I'm going to have to leave. No, we stay to the end, people. We stay to the end of the game. So you'll be able to handle their games. It won't matter if it goes two hours. You'll be able to handle it. All right, so let's go on. <laughs> Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, and we beg on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Verse 22, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, because what we could not do, Jesus did. So that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Say, I'm righteous. Amen. Say, I'm righteous. Amen. You've been made righteous. Your spirit, man, is alive. Yes. When you call on the name of the Lord, your spirit, man, is alive. Yes. It comes alive. It's what the whole world wants. Life with God. They want life. They want why they're here. They want why they were created. They want to know why they're breathing. And you'll find it when your life with God. And he'll make you righteous. He will not go through a checklist of all you've done wrong. He's already paid that price. He's like, my God, I don't have time to sit here and talk to you about everything you did. I paid the price for that. It's taken care of. It's under the blood. I just need you to make me Lord so I can put a new spirit in you, put my own spirit in you, and then you can change the way you think and hold control your body. Yeah. And then you'll start displaying li righteous life. Yeah. Because the Bible tells us in, first, uh, uh, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, he says, But I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall what? Live by faith. What will a righteous man do? Faith. Live by faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. It's the word of the king. What's the king saying? How's his way of doing it? What's he want to do? How's he want you to handle that situation? How's he want you to respond right now? 
And then he gives us fruits that come with his spirit. That means when we want to be mad and punch somebody out, we can actually have self-control. When somebody keeps, you know, aggravating us, we can walk in long suffering. Because now we say, no, 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 you don't get to do what you want to do. Emotions, you don't get to talk like you want to. You don't get to act like you want to anymore. I got somebody on the inside and me, I'm different. And you don't control me anymore. No, my spirit controls everything else that's going on out here. Hallelujah. Because I can do it God's way. I've been made equipped. Proverbs 20 22 says, so you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. You got to keep to the path. Now, I'll just tell you, can you stray? Yes. What do you do? Repent. You confess. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, it's to believers, not lost people, that if you sin, Right? If you're unrighteous, because that's sin, unrighteousness, if we confess our sin, he'll cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Right? So he'll do that because why? You'll actually know when you're fixing to go wrong. Because now someone's in you that can talk to your spirit that's alive to God and can hear from God and say, hold on a minute now before you say that. Hold on a minute now before you throw that punch. Hold on, which he'd be talking way before the punch is coming, you know. That's because some of y'all just got muscle memory. (laughs) Hold on now before you act that way. But then if you act that way, he'll say, why'd you act that way? And then if you're like, Lord, I shouldn't have acted that way. Forgive me. He says, okay, I forgive you. Now let's keep training on how to respond righteously because you were made to display this. So in order to display righteousness, here's the thing. God's not going to do it for you. God has made your spirit man alive so you now can, but you still control it. I say you control it. You control it. You know, a lot of times in universities, they like to pick on God because, again, they have the false premise God's in control, right? Right? Well, if God's in control, then he can stop this bottle from breaking. You know, you've heard that, and then it bounced, and it didn't break. That doesn't prove that there's God, because God doesn't have to prove to you that he is God. He is God, and he's already proven it through creation, so you're without excuse anyway. In fact, if you're trying to pick up, I mean, if you don't even think he exists, why are you bringing it up in the classroom anyway? Have you ever noticed that? I mean, if, if he doesn't exist, what does it matter if someone believes? I mean, it's really like a waste of your talking point. To try to prove something that doesn't exist. But with that being said, God is in control of his word. And he's given you now power because he made you righteous. So you have to put it on. You have to put it on in your mind and you have to put it on concerning your body. And he says this in Ephesians 4, 24, and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So I put it on. I make a choice every day that I'm going to live the life that God saved me to. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to live for my heavenly father. I'm going to live to serve him because he's life. I'm going to choose to obey what he says because, again, it's life. He's keeping me from running out in the road. He's keeping me from touching something hot. He's keeping me so that I can always be in a perpetual place of life. And I'm just going to follow that. That's awesome. How great is that? So if he says, say, do this, then I put on and I do because it brings life. As you know, I've given this testimony before that one time I was in the National Guard and that uh, I was having a conversation with some people and a person of a uh, higher rank than me uh, came up here to our conversation. I happened to be talking about the Lord and they didn't like it. And again, why does God bother you so much? If you don't believe him, why does he bother you so much? Why does it matter if we're talking about it? Well, it's because there is one. And that's why. And you're trying to find a reason not to believe. When you already know there is. And you know that you're going to have to lay it all down for him. But what are you laying down? 
Death. That's the thing, you're laying down death to take up life. We were talking, and I don't know what happened, but all next thing you know, my cheek was burning. He slapped me in the face in front of all these people. Well, I happened to be wearing a leather necklace back in the day. Don't wear that today because I don't need it on the outside to let me know what I am on the inside. I'm not saying you can't wear them. I'm just saying I don't which was WWJD, what would Jesus do? It just happened to work that day. He pulled it up out of my shirt. He said, what's that stand for? I said, well, that's WWJD, what would Jesus do? So I'm going to turn my other cheek and let you slap me there. And I said that. Well, he was a little embarrassed by that. But that was just what the Lord told me to do. You understand, most people don't want to suffer natural embarrassment but if you'll actually do God, it opens up bigger things. So let me tell you the end of the story. The person who slapped me on the face paid mine and my wife's second year of Bible college. Yeah, the second year. He slapped me because of my God conversation but ultimately paid for our way to continue to learn about the God we were talking about. And because I did it God's way, it gave me life to money that paid for the tuition because I did it his way. And it was a year and a half later before that showed up. The righteous life is an awesome way to live. It may not have an immediate reward, for everyone else to see, but it definitely has an immediate war with you, with you because you know I did what God said and it's going to produce life. Again, in Colossians 3.10 says, and put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one created him. What's sad is so many believers ask Jesus in their heart to save them. They're, they, can't, they are righteous in their spirit, but they never save their soul. They're never putting it on especially if they don't uh, uh, attend where they can be discipled. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, they never live up their full potential because they're not putting on and releasing all the power that's within them. He goes on and says in Ephesians 6, 11, put on, say put on. You have to put it on. You've been made to display. You have to put it on. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against, uh, firm against the schemes of the devil. So who's in charge of beating the devil down now? You are. Lord, I wish you'd do something about the devil. He's like, I did. You do something. I did. I have stripped him of his power and authority over your life. You are no longer in his kingdom. You are in mine. He doesn't own you. He's been, his works have been destroyed in your life. Now just go ahead and stand up and put on what I made you. So no believer should be saying, the devil, no, you made you do it. You made you do it. You chose to do it, and God wasn't in control of that choice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Ephesians 6, 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on, say put on, the breastplate of righteousness. You got to put it on. You have to put it on. You have to put on now what you've been made. Now, let me tell you some benefits that happen because you're righteous. We're going to close with this. In Psalms eleven seven, 7, it says this, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. There's never an issue to come before the Lord when you are in right standing with a governing authority. Never. And even if you mis mistake, make a mistake, you know that he loves you so much, he just wants you to, come on, come back, let's have a conversation. And you're like, man, gosh, Lord, you just told me that I shouldn't have done. Thank you. I love you. Forgive me of that. He's like, done. Forgiven. Is that like you never happened? Now let's just release who you are. That's how he is. He's awesome. He's loving. He's loving. He's awesome. 
It goes on and says this, cast your burden on the, upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never, say never, never. allow the righteous to be shaken. Okay. Never, say never. never, let the righteous be shaken. There's nothing that can happen in this planet that sends me to shaking. Because he said, as long as I am displaying my righteousness, I'm living right. I'm doing everything that I'm doing. Heart, soul, mind, strength, serving him. He'll never let me be shaken. Bad news don't shake me because he's going to deliver me. I said he's going to. I can't be shaken because of the deliverance that I get for being righteous. Look what it says here in Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them Come on, say it again. Out of how many? All. How many? All. All of them. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulations, and it definitely does mean that the world that's not righteous is going to afflict you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to scorn you. They're going to say that you're no good. They're going to say your God's nothing. They're going to try to tempt you. As I told you when I was going to Bible college, I had a guy that at work, and they, when we got off work, you know, we did a third shift, and they went to a strip club. I'm married, I'm in Bible college, and Tommy says, why don't you come to the club? I'm like, no, I'm not coming to the club, Tommy. Come on, man, you know you want to go to the club with us. I said, Tommy, I am married, number one. Number two, that would be a sin against my God. Just not doing it, bro. In fact, you're looking at somebody you can't touch. I can look and touch as much as I want to. Tommy's like, before you graduate and leave, I'm going to get you in the strip club. I said, Tommy, there's more real that I'll get you born into the kingdom of God before you'll ever see me in a strip club. So the last night, I'm leaving at 5 a.m., not 7 when it's quitting time, but 5 a.m., because I'm going to get in my vehicle and head to Atlanta, where my wife and children already are, because we, they've been there a month bef before. We've graduated from Ramah. I just stayed back a month later, received a little more finance, and I'm leaving. And everybody on shift knows. And at 4.30, Tommy says, hey, Earl, come here. So we went around to the back of the warehouse, drove around there with our forklifts, cherry pickers. I said, what's up, man? He says, you know, you've been a real good friend to me. He says, um, I want to get things right with God. And I prayed with him to be born again. I never made it to the strip club. <laughs> Why? Not because it's not tempting, not because I couldn't have, not because the enemy was definitely trying, but it's because I put on righteousness. I said, that man's dead. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it. And that's death. That'd kill my marriage. That kills everything. That kills the anointing. It kills the plan of God for my life. And I'm not going to do that. And God delivers me out of all my trouble, out of all of it. See, that's the good thing about being righteous. You know you got to deliver all the time. You want justice? Then get righteous. Because when you're righteous, the righteous judge will judge. And I've already said this to our congregation. There's nothing going on in planet Earth that the king is not going to deal with. Ain't nothing. You can't die and God don't know about it and going to vindicate. It's going to happen. He goes on in Psalms 37, 25. He said, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have ne not seen. I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Woo, it's good to be righteous. I said, it's good to be righteous. He goes on and says, great wealth. Look at this in Proverbs. Great wealth is in the house of the righteous, but trouble is in the income of the wicked. Now, that, the wicked can have a lot of income. But there's great wealth in the house of the righteous. You just stay with God, every penny you need, you're going to have. You're going to have it. Because the world can't take it. In fact, there are people right now that aren't following God saving money for you. So the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the... 
Boy, aren't you glad you're righteous? Aren't you glad you're righteous? So go ahead and make billions because the day's coming. It's transferring. And it's not when I go to heaven because heaven don't need it. Heaven paves their seats with it, their streets with it. Are you hearing me? And brings it to the earth. <laughs> I ain't going to talk about that. Okay. Psalms 37, 30 to 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. And his tongue speaks. If you're not righteous, you don't speak justice. Because only the righteous can speak justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. And then the thing that's probably the most frustrating in most people's lives, I conclude with James, because we are to display, we were made to display our righteousness. God caused us to be born of God so that we can then display it in our behavior, in our actions, controlling our flesh so that we're not subject to the things of the world anymore. We have control now. And he says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man. You know, the world prays. And there's been many that have prayed to God. They don't know him. In fact, some things are going on in Israel right now, right? And Joshua uh, has developed a relationship with a couple that is from Israel. Now, they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They've not confessed Jesus as Lord. He's been to their house to learn some of their Jewish traditions so that it, he can continue to gleam as we grow in Scripture of how some of the types and shadows, because we know they all point to the Messiah, to the King. And he gives him more understanding and he's talked with them about it. And he called and said, how are you doing? And she said, it was her and her daughters are there. He said, well, we're safe. We're somewhere, we're close to the airport. We're some of this, one of the most safe, safest places in Israel. But yesterday we did run to the bomb shelter three times. Three times. And then she said this, pray for me. And they don't believe in praying to the same one we pray to get effective answers. So the world prays. And people are frustrated because they pray to God expecting an answer under false pretenses. He's in control. Why don't he do what I want? I asked him to do this. Surely what I'm asking is the right thing without ever asking him, Lord, you know what I'm in. What do you want me to do? Most people's prayers are demanding God to do it their way. Children crying out, Lord, don't let mom and daddy get a divorce. God can't control mom and dad not getting a divorce. Just like he couldn't control Adam from eating the fruit. And then we blame God. The mom and dad ain't married. Or I didn't have a dad when I was growing up. Or this happened to me by my uncle. God didn't control that. But the devil sure was in play in all these people's lives, bringing death and telling them it's right. You know how many parents are divorcing thinking it's right? It's better for the kids. When what's right is for them to repent, forgive each other, love God with all their heart, act like it's never happened, and be godly parents for their children. There's many things I could say. But the Bible says the prayer of a righteous man. Now that prayer is always answered. Because a righteous man will go to the Lord and say, how do I pray about this one? Lord, how do I pray? Because I'm right with you. 
Uh, let me go this way. I can go as far as to say this. You don't even need to know God. But if you'll ask him, he can answer you. Yeah. It's a man by the name of Cornelius. He's loving God the best he can, but he ain't right with God. He's not born again. And God sent an angel to that man's house and says, you need to send for Peter. You need Peter to come to your house. Because what he will tell you will change your life. And the angel doesn't tell him. And Cornelius, separated from God, sent for Peter. And Peter showed up and began to talk about the king and the remission of sin and repenting and being filled with the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father. And while he was still preaching, Cornelius says, I believe in his heart. And he got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, Peter's like, well, they got it. And I didn't even give an altar call. Church, we were made to display. St. Augustine needs us to show them who we are in Christ. We've got to put it on every day. That way, when they look at us, they'll know, man, I tried to do what you're doing and to live the way you're living, and I can't. What's different? And you'll say, his name's Jesus. He did it all. And he started the process of me.